In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart to confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. We are here. And I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive me. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, your merciful sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you for the promise of mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter suffering.
and then to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Kindly be seated as we turn to God's perfect word. The Old Testament is from Leviticus chapter 19. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another, you shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of the Lord of your God, I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor, but rob him. The wages of hired servants shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf, put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor, or defer to the great, but in righteousness, shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. So the Old Testament lesson was truly God's perfect law, and then comes the epistle lesson, which is so much of his grace and love. Colossians 1, 1 14. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Which has come to you as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and is growing as it also does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, my beloved, our beloved servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This also is the word of the Lord. Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. 
nothing. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So also a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring out oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. Now which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, Christian, tell one another what you believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the 
where it says, Behold, a lawyer rose up to put Jesus to the test. And he asked him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Well, what is written? How do you read it? He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replied, You've answered correctly. Just do this and you will live. But the lawyer, wishing to justify himself, said, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus told a wonderful story of the Good Samaritan. <coughs> It's really a joy to look at to say that before we begin the service. Um, it's so good. I worship last week with Pastor here, and Pastor Sherry's away, and he um, had that beautiful sermon about how miracles and healings are all so good, but the most important thing is rejoice that your name is written in the book of heaven. And this truly is the most important hour of the week, especially as our country goes through such ridiculous and sad and horrible things that's going on with all the rules and things. So it's a pleasure and it's a joy and it's so important for me to be with you as it is for you to be with the Lord and I pray that God would bless us as we pray in that first hymn, Lord, open my heart to hear. Give me strength, give me victory for that world out there that is increasingly in trouble, our country and elsewhere. Now, in this Good Samaritan parable, the lawyer wasn't the lawyer as we talk about lawyers. He was a lawyer in the sense that he was an expert in not civic law and criminal law like our lawyers are, but he was an expert in Jewish Old Testament law. Perhaps he was a scribe. And he didn't come to Jesus as we come just hungry for light and for truth when we see darkness so much every moment of our lives on television and all around us in news. He came to Jesus to test him, to try him, not to relish his words and find his truth and light in his heart, solid to live for. So he came to Jesus and he opened up with that question, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I stress the word do because he was an expert of the law. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And he was in so many ways, like so many people in America, he believed that if he lived a good life, if he did good things and kept his nose clean and kept his damn lines out of the yard, you know, all that sort of thing, that he'd go to heaven if anybody would. He would, after all. He wasn't in prison. He wasn't a horrible sinner. Um, what must I be doing, Jesus, to inherit eternal life? And the Bible says that if you manage to live a perfect, sinless life, the law is our friend. It's good. It's wonderful. It's helpful. It's a right path. He said if you manage, the Bible says if you manage to keep the law perfectly, you will live. But God said you shall be perfect even as God is perfect. His standard is holiness because he's holy now. You can't tolerate evil because he is not impure. He is righteous and perfect and holy or he wouldn't be God. And so the Bible goes on to say, and it's so important, that by the works of the law, no one will be justified. For every one of us has sinned and fallen far, far short of the glory of God. So all of us who have broken the law time and time again cannot do heaven. We don't come to church somehow trying to earn God's love. He already establishes that for us. And that included the lawyer. And this is why we cherish the cross and lift it high. Because John 3, 16, our favorite verse in so many ways, reminds us that God so loved the whole wide world, every single one around the world, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish in their sin, but shall have life everlasting. And that's not trite. We're dealing with eternity when we speak these words. Where will we spend it? Trust the Lord. And I know that still 
plagues us, this idea of word righteousness. I have to confess, my first, when I was a young person, my first inclination to be a pastor was this word righteous thing. As a young person, I was kind of mixed up in some ways, and I knew I was sinful in ways, and I just thought, well, if I just become a pastor, maybe God will love me. So in a way, I discovered grace and preached it to myself, in a way, in preaching to others. And see, I've been a Lutheran all my life. I mean, I sat before my father, who was a wonderful gospel preacher, and I really, I loved the idea that Jesus died for me, but somehow it didn't saturate me, and I still walked around, and still, I'm still carrying this guilt, I'm still not what I should be, I'm still this poor, miserable sinner. Yes, I've sinned, but I'm forgiven, I'm cleansed, I'm a new child of God, I don't have to look behind me in the rearview mirror of my life, I can look forward. Well, the question that the lawyer asked Jesus showed his regard for the law, but his ignorance of the gospel. Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I think that's kind of interesting. There's a contradiction right there, because an inheritance is a gift. It's not a paycheck. In our epistle lesson today, it talks about that we're we children of God, we're sons and daughters of God, our Father, and we inherit grace, we inherit forgiveness. We inherit all the blessings of heaven. So when he says, what must I do to inherit, he's contradicting. Do you follow me? Because inheritance is a gift. Some of our kids can be absolutely rotten at times, and yet we still give them their inheritance, unless they're completely irresponsible. I guess we could write them out of our will. And so we sinful people have this glorious inheritance, which is a gift not earned. So Jesus answers the lawyer with another question. It seems like Jesus is trying to show this man his huge fatal error of not trusting in him for heaven, for eternal life. I believe he's saying, okay, lawyer, expert in the law, religious law, you want to go to heaven by being good, by your sinful self? Let's see how you're doing. What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answers with a perfect summary of the law. He had it down, rock solid. He knew it was by the Old Testament. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And it's really true that God wants all of our hearts. We're totally his. He created you. He made you. He gives you the breath to breathe and the heart that's beating at this moment. He sustains you, he forgives you, he buys you back. And so the happiest life lived is a life that says, all I am, all I have, my heart, my soul, my resources, my strength are for you, Lord Jesus. I remember in college, when I finally got away from home, I had to decide for myself, is this Jesus real? Is God really there? And when by faith I knew that he was, it was such a revealing, such a wonderful experience in my heart to say, God, I just want to live for you. I just want to give it all up for you. And you see, any other response is sort of half-hearted and half-committed. And it's just sad that Jesus warned about being lukewarm, the Bible does. It just makes your Christian life boring when you don't rise up in the morning and say, I'm here to live for you, Lord. Show me people to love and show me things like that. And he goes on to say, and love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself. And there are verses in the Bible where Jesus said, he who hates his life will find it, he who loves his life in this world will lose it, but he's talking about our sin nature. I really believe that some Christians think we should never love ourselves. We should only love God. I, I disagree with that because Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And if I just believe I'm only a poor, miserable sinner, and I'm just a rotten person, and there's nothing good in me. And of course, it's true, I am a sinner, but I'm also redeemed, and I have God's love, and he gives me his motives, and his power, and his spirit, and all these things created in him image. image. If I'm just down on myself all the time, how can I love my neighbor as myself if I don't really even love myself in a good way? And then when you cross that line of becoming selfish, you're sinning. So to say love your neighbor as yourself is a beautiful thing because the, the proof that you're loving yourself in a godly way means 
that you're so filled with God's love that you're loving your neighbor on the same level that you love yourself. For example, in my first church in Waterloo, Iowa, we had a, a youth director, a youth pastor, he wasn't a pastor yet, a DC director of Christian education who also was in charge of our youth. But he had this beautiful stereo system at the time. He would just let the kids use that. And I was kind of amazed because it was his own personal stereo system. And I said, Bruce, you let the kids use this really good system. He said, Pastor, if it's too good to loan out, it's too good for me. That's such a wonderful example. I never forgot that. If it's too good to loan out, it's too good for me. Now, of course, you wouldn't give a 10 year old the keys to your car. Duh. You know, you've got to be responsible and all that. So Jesus challenged the man, yes, give your heart to God, give your heart to me. Love your neighbor as yourself. He had the answer right. His words were revealing, though he had the answer right, but he didn't have his life right. See, we can be educated far beyond our level of obedience. And Bible classes and all the knowledge is a wonderful thing, and I'm so glad that Lutherans are so good on doctrine, but I believe God is also saying, now that you know these things, how blessed you'll be if you do them. What's your level of obedience? And so often I can be educated far beyond my level of obedience to the things I know that God wants me to do. So like this lawyer, Jesus says, great answer, you've got it. You get an A plus on your confirmation exam, if this was a confirmation exam. If you're going to get to heaven, just do this. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your life, and always love your neighbor as yourself, and you will live. And the next words are so revealing. But he, wishing to justify himself, asked, who is my neighbor? That's how it led up to the Good Samaritan. He asked, who's my neighbor? He's trying to get Jesus off the subject. It's interesting, in 30 seconds, he goes from offense to defense, from challenging Jesus, testing him, trying him, to trying to justify himself. Because in his heart, he knew he didn't love the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind and his strength. He knew that he didn't love his neighbor as himself consistently and constantly. He's on the defense because deep down, I believe he knew he didn't keep the laws of God that he had memorized so faithfully. He's trying to justify himself. And that is human nature, my friends. Ever since Adam and Eve, God walks in the garden. He confronts Adam, our first father. Have you sinned in so many words? What does he do? He points to Eve and he says, the woman. The woman. And then he goes to the woman, Eve, and he says, what's going on if you sin and eat of that tree? Who does she point to? The serpent. Satan. He deceived me. It's so natural to want to justify ourselves, to rationalize, to run, to be finding a loophole. And it would have been so much better if the man would have just fell before Jesus and said, oh, Lord, forgive me. I don't love people the way I should. I don't have the heart that I need to have. I don't love God with all my heart and soul. I can't love him without your grace and without your power and without your joy. And yet he did. He ran. People say that love is an action verb. You've heard that all the time. It's true. Love does go into action, as eventually the Good Samaritan story does. I believe that love first is a condition of the heart. It's an attitude. And all the laws in the world <coughs> cannot make you or I love someone. Only God can do that. We love him because he first loved us and gave himself on that cross. And then when we're filled with his grace and with his love, when we constantly come to that communion table and hear of his grace and his love, his love just naturally overflows in the lives of others. I think what happened in Dallas this week is just 
incredible example of that. We have so many laws against murder, laws against racism, laws against this and that. And you know, when I speak of my black friends about the shooting of those police officers, what, five dead, something like that, my black Christian friends agree because they're brothers in Christ. And they'll say the very same thing. The only thing that can change this racism in America is the love of God. Because laws might keep us externally good for a while, but only God can change our hearts. And love flows from a changed heart. All the laws in the books will never erase racist hearts and attitudes. And this man knows he doesn't love God, so he tries to get God, Jesus, off the subject. He asks a no-brainer question. It's really a sidetracking question. And who is my neighbor? And then the parable begins. Of course, he'd been so much happier if he would have repented, but he chose to let his pride rule him. And who is my neighbor, Jesus? It's a stupid question, isn't it, when you think about it? As though we can kind of carve up the human race according to ethnicity or gender or age, rich or poor, educated, uneducated, the unborn. Who is my neighbor? As though everyone in the whole world is my neighbor in some sense. It's so wrong, it's so stupid, and really that's what's happening in America, folks, when we divide everybody up into categories. But God so loved the whole world, he loved everyone. Equally, he dies for us all, period. Who's my neighbor? And Jesus doesn't even honor that inane question. He goes right into talking about a man who's robbed and beaten and left half dead, bleeding to death, beaten up, maybe unconscious, whatever. That's about all he says about the hurting neighbor. But in the parable, if you notice, he gives a lot of attention to the people passing by. There's this priest. He sees the severely wounded man on the side. And he doesn't want to get involved. I mean, uh, the robbers might still be around, but I've got a good reason not to. And he crosses the street to avoid him. Same with the Levite. Same story. Sees the beaten, dying man on the road. Walks by on the other side. And then Jesus, and he's creating this story, this parable. Jesus can create this parable any way he wants to. And he says, but a Samaritan, a Samaritan, Jews hated Samaritans. Talk about racism. They were unworthy pagans. They cursed them in public. They prayed that they would not have a part in the resurrection. A Samaritan, my friends, saw the man, and he could not pass by. He had to stop. Sure, the robbers could still be around, but there's a man half dead here, my friends. That didn't stop him that far. He took pity on this beaten person. His heart was filled with compassion and love. He got off of his animal, probably a donkey. He got down to the ground and got his hands dirty and muddy and full of blood as he probably stripped some of his own clothing and bandages. And it says Jesus that he poured oil and wine, whatever he had, to kind of cleanse his wounds and bandage him. And then he put him on his own donkey and he walked to the end. And then he stayed with the man all day, the rest of the day, and he stayed overnight, changing his plans. And he told the innkeeper, take care of him. He gave him money. And if I owe you anything more, don't spare anything for this fellow. And when I return, get back, he's going to change his plans and come back to see how he's doing. Wow, isn't it interesting how Jesus wrote this story? so close to love your neighbor as you would hope to be loved yourself if you were the beaten, dying person on the side of the road. And when I return, I'm going to come back and see how he's doing. I'll pay you, Mr. Innkeeper, anything that I need to pay you, any extra money. So, we're getting to the end of the parable and the end of the story. And by the end of the parable, Jesus has totally turned it around. 180 degree turn from this pointless, inane question, 
who is my neighbor, how can I categorize them, how can I decide which ones are worthy of my love, who's my neighbor, all the way around to which one of these three was a loving neighbor to the person in need. What kind of person was the Samaritan? And the lawyer got it right. He said, the one who showed compassion on him. Notice, maybe that was even part of the table. He didn't say the Samaritan. He didn't even mention the Samaritan. He said, that one who showed compassion on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. You got it right again, lawyer. Go and do likewise. But that really convicts me. And maybe that's the learning point of the Good Samaritan. Not who is my neighbor, but what kind of a neighbor am I? Am I really like that Good Samaritan? What kind of person am I? How often do I pass by those in need whom God has placed before me? Or how often am I so blessed and so graced with the love of Jesus Christ that I sacrifice some time and some money and some energy and my love overflows into others? And in my heart, I want to be that kind of person. I want to change. Every time we take communion, we're reminded that Jesus said, take drink. He said, this cup is the New Testament, the New Covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And it's so wonderful to receive the forgiveness of sins and his blood has purchased that for us. But that's not all his blood in the new covenant purchased for us. In Ezekiel 36, it talks about the new covenant, and it's including the promise, and I will give you a new heart of flesh and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone, your judgmental, standoffish, walk on the other side of the road, heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh that throbs with love and compassion with others. See, I don't need to classify who is my neighbor. I need that heart of love. And this is an interesting that Jesus died to give that lawyer that new heart. And he secures that for us with his blood. And I want love to be my default attitude, my default emotion every time I lock eyes with someone. And we're not perfect at that, but I want to grow in love. I want God to change me. I want God to change you by His grace this morning and make us more sensitive to others. Because Trinity, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have God's grace. We have His perfect freedom. We have His love. We have His peace. We have all that we need to change our environment for the good. He simply says, now that you know this truth, go and do likewise. Amen. And this wonderful grace and peace of God that passes all human understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful teaching from your Son, Jesus our Lord. It's really clear here that the Samaritan was a very different kind of person. The priest, the Levite, they saw the dying man, they walked by. The Samaritan felt compassion, Lord. He was so different. My conviction when I read this is that I need to change, Lord. I don't need to figure out what my neighbor is. There's a bigger issue. I want to be that Samaritan. So I ask you to help me and to help us all to simply change. You did, Jesus, you died to purchase this change, to give us a new heart of love, a new spirit within us. As we prayed a moment ago, creating me a new heart, O oh Lord. Purchased on the cross, paid in full, all to your glory. Father, we pray that you would comfort and bless the families and loved ones of the police who died in Dallas, Texas. Bless our policemen and women, protect them in their service to our citizens. And Lord, should a police person or any of our leaders commit crimes, grant them godly repentance and bring them to justice as well. Protect all Americans and make justice be equally distributed throughout our land. Father, protect us from all this unnecessary violence that's going on even at this time. And may your kingdom grow in our land. Father, we thank you that we have your grace and your power and your beauty. We need not fear. We can only obey. In our prayers this morning, we remember Shirley Arnold's brother, Larry Heidel, who is quite ill. Lord, grace him with your presence and strength, and if it be your will, of course, bring some healing and help, and especially bring him close to you, Lord Jesus, in faith. Pray for all the discouraged and sick, the poor, the tempted. Lord, we lift up Pastor Sherry on vacation away. We pray that this would be a time of renewal for our Pastor Sherry. What a beautiful brother and the Lord is to me and to us. Give him refreshment, O oh Lord, and peace in his heart. And may your grace just explode in his mind and in his servants and all that he does. All these, these things we pray in the prayer that you taught us, Lord Jesus, together. Our Father, before I was dead. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
shine on you and be gracious unto you. May he always look upon you with his favor and give you this peace. Church tomorrow, you will be here.